good. So, as you can see, I've made a list of 14 of my favorite female painters. And they're currently living. They're all living. Yeah, okay. Contemporary painters. Yeah. yeah. You'll see some themes in a lot of the work, I think. Mm -hmm. There'll be a theme of figurative painting coming back, which is something that seems is coming back in a lot of different... Could you sit up here, actually? Just so I can... Is there a room there? Oh, speak to you more normally? Sure. So you'll see there's a lot of figurative work. I'm kind of partial to figurative work. Just in general. I'm kind of a figurative work person. So I'm lo looking at a lot of different figurative painters and um, they tend to have kind of surreal elements to them as well that you'll see come up again, such as elongated bodies or distorted bodies and this sort of thing. Yes. So the first one, of course, is Inca Essenhai. Mm -hmm. We also know a very certain special Inca in our lives. Yes. But Inca Essenhai was the first time I actually encountered the name Inca. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came up with that name. She became popular in the mid-1990s and was among the first generation of American artists to return to figuration, since there was a lot of abstract work going on. It was kind of thought, as it always is, that the figure is dead and that the future is in abstraction or something like that. Right. But in the 1990s, we saw a resurgence of figurative work in the United States, and of course, this was accompanied by the young British artists in the UK as well who were coming up around that same time, and often their work involved the figure too. But you'll see kind of these big surreal elements in her work, just elongated cartoonish forms. This is a woman named Allison Summers, um, and this is her own statement that she has put up here. I'm a military brat with no hometown and a family from the South, a self-taught artist, I graduated from the University of Virginia with a BA in history. I work in a variety of media, concentrating on drawing and painting, but also employing collage, embroidery, book arts, and installation. Mm. And I like her because a lot of her work, she does a lot of miniatures. They're like the size of a thumbtack mm. almost. And um, this is a larger painting. Most of these are done in gouache, but they have these type of organic forms that are exploding out of this central figure mm -hmm. but they're also in a landscape you know situated in this kind of surrealistic landscape with beds with beds that reminds us of dreaming and that sort of stuff mm. dana schutz of course uh probably one of the most famous um, painters on the list uh dana schutz is an american artist who lives and works in brooklyn new york She's known for her gestural figurative paintings that often take on specific subjects or narrative situation as a point of departure. And of course, we all know Dana Schutz for the Emmett Till painting, which generated a lot of controversy because she painted Emmett Till in his casket mm. and also kind of employed her really like guttural and almost childlike cartoonish forms so a lot of people didn't like the fact that she made light of such a tragic incident and i believe she chose to never sell the painting so she doesn't ever want to make money mm. on it um this is just a younger a lot of these artists are really probably in their 20s mm. and this artist goes by the name super future kid and she was originally born in East Germany, currently lives in London, and she uses these really big, bold shapes and colors, and her work explores a wide range of subjects that circulate, circulate around certain ideas of childhood and youth, and provides a platform which is emotionally engaging and gives the observer an opportunity to discover an alternate dreamlike reality of themselves. And that's a quote from Mindy Solomon which is a gallery and um i just really like her work because it's ridiculously simple like a lot of this stuff is simple but just like spatially and visually they work really well 
And she also makes these really cool little stands. So she puts her paintings on stands and they sit on these ceramic figures that she makes mm. in places underneath her work. Emma Stern, she's also known as Lava Baby. And I'll read this quick. Stern bounces between internet application and canvas, cross-referencing 3D renderings with her painted scenes. Nearby, a body-length pillow features an avatar-like version of herself, or something close. She clarifies, I think that differentiating too much between virtual and real life is a disservice to both experiences. The virtual is very much real, and my online life is very much my real life. One of the things that is so cool about being an artist in the 21st century, and one of the reasons I feel so lucky to be making work in and about this specific moment, is because of that duality. The avatar I made of myself is palpable representation of that idea. That's from Cool Hunting. And you can see she makes these figurative paintings that look computer generated. You know, they have that feel of being like a 3D model of some sort, mm -hmm. but they're very realistically rendered. And she uses programs, different 3D programs, to create these uh, figures, which she paints. Rebecca Ness, um, here's a quote from Rebecca. As of late, I make work that has some semblance to my life, memory, or visual experience I've had in the world. Many times the events or scenarios are imagined, but they usually are triggered from something in reality. The moments in my paintings that relate to gender or identity politics are products of who I am and how I live my life. And she's quite young, um, in her 20s as well, and a recent Yale graduate. Mm. Sasha Gordon is the kid wonder of the entire group. Like, she literally makes me want to just stop painting. She's borderline genius i've missed the first part of her bio there um but she's still a, a student at RISD. she's still an undergrad at RISD um in providence but she was born in the bronx and her work explores self-image racial prejudice mental illness and the male gaze while also exhibiting discomfort with intimacy and the female body and she does a lot of these different paintings that are just ridiculously good paintings. Um, there's no other way to really say it. They're just awesome. Yes. <laughs> and she's super young, and that's annoying. Um, Kyle Staver, without res resorting to p something cynicism, Staver undoes the tropes we associate with depictions of heroic and mythical paintings and this is from John Yao and Hyperallergic and a lot of Kyle Staver's paintings you can see that they kind of reference these you know we almost feel like some fairy tale is unfolding within them or something like that but they're also really dark they're really painterly they have this glowing light in them all the time like you can see there's kind of like this glowing light mm -hmm. and a lot of her paintings have this one singular glowing light source that kind of illuminates the figures. Um, so she's not being cynical, and she's looking at kind of these mythical and heroic subjects and painting them um, authentically. Anna Park, here's a quote from her. She does charcoal paintings of figurative charcoal paintings. And so you can see these kind of disjointed figurative paintings and one thing about her is she's obviously just a really good draftsman, so she can just draw really, really well. Um, like this hand is really amazing. And so a quote from her is, rather than depicting any specific moments, I want to present instances of uncertain chaos. It's that fine line where every wild night out can come down to. I guess it's kind of how I feel with a lot of things that happen where a level of anxiety goes hand in hand with the unpredictable nature of life. Creating these crowd scenes brings you right into the mess of it all, where it's out of your control, but just immersed in motion. Jordan Castile, she's from Denver, and she has her work um, is rooted in social engagement, painting from her own photographs of people she encounters, 
uh, posing her subjects within their natural environments. And these are generally life-sized portraits and she'll often take pictures on the subway and then make paintings of these people or take like here you can see a guy who looks like he might be sitting on a refrigerator or something on the corner um, with this newsstand and all these sorts of things around and she's super uh, well known just had a re big retrospective at the new museum in New York Lola Gill is somebody I just like particularly and she says I was lonely and had a vivacious imagination my mom didn't let me play with friends very much, so I sank pretty deep into my world of toys. And she's kind of known for putting these really beautifully painted glass figurines in front of figurative paintings. Mm. So there's kind of this contrast between the still life image and the figurative painting behind it. But regardless of anything, these the porcelain she paints and the glass she paints is just really amazing in terms of the painterliness and the way it's executed danica lundy says i want painting to read like a poem or a nightmare to evoke a young lifetime's worth of cultural gunk great paintings friction disillusionment jubilation heartache i want a painting that i can be totally consumed by I wish these next words were mine, and I regretfully can't remember whose they are, but I want my paintings to be a novel that opens up in every direction. I want them to awaken like a dark room does, slowly at the tips of fingers, into a visceral hyper-reality that shows everything at once, though I'll always fail at that too. And you can kind of see a bit of Dana Schutz, this type of clunky, big figure, but one thing I find really amazing about Danica Lundy is that these multifigural compositions are, you know, they're historically set within, you know, narrative figure painting, history painting, and these sort of things. But she has this ability to make, like, look at this hand in the foreground here, mm -hmm. and just how much in front of that that feels. You know, like what a weird way to approach a composition and put a hand coming out like that and just working perfectly within. It doesn't over make it overbearing or overpower the painting at all. And this carpet just feels so shaggy and nice and all these people looking around at the same time. Um, just in terms of paint application, she's really awesome and really fun to look at. Catherine Bradford is um, also super well-established compared to the rest of these. She's definitely older than the rest of them, um, but she's based out of New York City, and she's known for these paintings of swimmers, superheroes, and ships that critics describe as simultaneously representational and abstract, luminous and richly metaphorical. And a lot of her paintings, when I think of Catherine Bradford or somebody would bring up her name, I think the first thing that would pop into your head would be one of these nighttime paintings of people swimming in a pool at night um, with this sort of blue universe around them and a moon up in the sky. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of those different types of paintings. Right. Darina Kaprov. Um, is I think she was born yeah she was born in Russia it says up there too and over the years Darina has process has often involved the rendering of tangled thoughts skeins of memory and the mapping of synaptic connections in her mind this imagery both abstract and figurative is rooted in her childhood in the Soviet Union the entanglement confusion and anxiety of that time collides with a child's sense of wonder free association and vision Kaprov meticulously by, builds up her paintings, drawings, and sculptures with multiple layers of textures and shapes executed in precise detail. So you can kind of see a lot of these connections throughout this. They kind of feel like you should recognize what's happening. And down here, this almost looks like a Salvador Dali sort of 
when you're looking at an image and trying to figure out if it's like a cloud and mm. is that a dog or is it George Washington or whatever. So there's that kind of element of blobbiness in this work. But there's also this, what they talk about, that synaptic quality where you can tell she's probably looking at different um, reference photos of the brain and how synapses work and all that sort of stuff as well. So those are 14 of my favorite living female artists, and I hope you saw some similarities between all of them and connections and found some that you like for yourself.